Hi folks, David Jameson here, editor of Conta.co.uk, and I'm joined once again by our wonderful board member, economist, writer, George Kerrivan, to discuss some of the uh, latest developments in, in Scottish politics, especially around the Scottish Government. George, thanks very much for, for coming on again. Nice to be here on the sunny day. It's 23 here in Edinburgh. It's amazing. Yes, it's roasting. I've had to blot out the light uh, streaming in behind me. Uh, I'm actually in, in sunny air, so I should be down the seafront, but here I am doing my duty uh, and uh, bringing you the latest on. Um, what I described in an article on the website recently as the deep freeze uh, in, in Scottish economic policy. So south of the border, even Keir Starmer now is talking about schemes of, sort of national procurement uh, taking advantage of our exit from the European Union to discuss how the, the British state could best use its money to boost uh, domestic capacity uh, in the British economy. Meanwhile, in Scotland, uh, the language has remained frozen at the point of about 1996. Uh, in recent weeks, uh, we've seen the, the Scottish government celebrate Scotland's record on foreign direct, attracting foreign direct investment. Uh, Kate Forbes has established, this is the Scottish Government Finance Minister, established a 10-year plan which harks on and on about uh, uh, entrepreneurialism and uh, you know, business competitiveness uh, and, all this, and all this kind of stuff. What's, what's the big picture here? I mean, what's going on? Why is the Scottish Government trailing behind wider developments and discussion of economic policy? Sure. I mean, the Scottish government actually for the last four or five years hasn't had an economic policy. Uh, if you look at it historically, when, when SNP first came to government in 2007, they thought there would be uh, a referendum very quickly, which they would win, or they'd be thrown out of office. Uh, so John Sweeney, who was the then first um, economics minister had a very short term policy. And essentially they just spent everything, they had a desperate effort to, to boost um, uh, effective demand in Scotland. Because remember in 2007, they'd, they'd, they'd come to power right in the start of the, the banking crisis and the global meltdown. Uh, so Sweden spent, you know, he, he spent everything he had. In fact, he took a few risks, which is rare for a Scottish government minister to take a risk. Uh, and he actually started spending money up front. He was spending money uh, that, that uh, ahead of time uh, so that if you moved on, he would, he would have run out of cash. So, um, no, and, and also he cut every tax he could manage to cut, which was not in the circumstances of that global crisis, it was not necessarily a bad idea at that moment. Um, so actually, you know, in a very crude way, they managed to boost demand uh, uh, to the extent they had levers of power. Uh, and in, in that recession uh, from the, the, you know, two, three years after the, after the banking crisis, um, though the economy contracted, it contracted less quickly than England. And it came out of recession faster than England. Uh, so to an extent, they, they, you know, they felt justified, but they did it by just you know, um, spending every penny they had. Now you then get to um, the referendum, uh, uh, which they lose. Uh, only by not much, um, but they're then they're then the room. The, the, the SNP government by that point, um, Salmond leaves and uh, 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 Sturgeon comes in. Um, they don't have a project. I mean, they're, they're stuck there in government. Um, uh, there's no instant project prospect of another referendum. Um, so they have to manage uh, a Scottish capitalist economy trapped with few powers inside the EU. What do they do? And the answer, and I think, actually, you, 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 David mentioned one of your recent postings. Um, uh, they talk left and steal right. Uh, they, have, they have no money, they have very little powers. So um, there, there's, there's constant um, uh, uh, initiatives which sound brilliant until you see they're actually spending threepence on these initiatives. They don't actually have any uh, impact on the economy. Uh, and the only way they can get anything to happen in the economy is by retreating further and further to a neoliberal uh, economic policy, which essentially is to rely on inward investment. And there's a certain inward investment. And in fact, what you see over the last uh, decade 
is more and more of the Scottish economy ends up in foreign ownership. Now, it used to be just you know core sections of manufacturing. Um, if you look at the last decade, uh, the most vibrant part of the Scottish economy, which is agro agribusiness, agribusiness is practically entirely owned uh, by major foreign concerns. So we're tied into uh, 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 global neo ne neoliberal uh, economic uh, networks. And so, I, so bottom line, they don't have any economic policy, so they're desperate. Now, now they've won yet another election. The downside is, what do they do with it? Uh, and so, um, uh, if they've just pulled another rabbit out of a hat, which is this new economic advisory committee with the great and the good, and it's going to prepare a ten-year plan. Uh, and the first draft is to be ready by the autumn. Let's remember that, folks. Uh, so they're going to produce a plan uh, by the autumn for a, a ten-year re uh, reconstruction of the Scottish economy, which I presume. Well, it means that, you know, since they keep telling us we're going to have a, a referendum, which means an independent Scotland. Um, but who have they put on this advisory board? Um, uh, it's ex most of them. Most of the people involved are extremely right wing, uh, have a neoliberal model. And the key one is, is Nick McPherson, who used to run the Treasury, who was the Treasury Permanent Secretary uh, uh, under, under Gordon Brown. And then um, uh, uh, um, uh, all the Tories that came afterwards, um, the 216. So, I mean, what, what kind of economic plan are we going to get? It's, hard, it's hardly likely to be socialist, is it? Indeed, and, um, you know, I've seen a few people say of McPherson in, in particular, because he was not just someone who was an architect of, um, you know, in Whitehall of the, the kind of neoliberal state Britain-wide, he was also someone who was a kind of anti-independence cadre around the time of the referendum. And I've seen a few people say, oh, he's changed his mind. He supports independence now. Um, as though that were the equivalent of, and you get people sort of saying, can't just tell people off because they didn't support independence last time. This isn't Jimmy or Mary down the road who were, wasn't convinced by the Yes campaign because of the Yes campaign's failings. This is a member of the British ruling elite who is involved in attacking the democratic aspirations of the movement, that's a rather different situation. It's not necessarily encouraging that the McPhersons and the Murray Foots of the world and these sorts of, this, these kind of kind of elite operators, people operating at a certain level of power and prestige in organizing a system which is fundamentally anti-working class. It's not necessarily a good thing for the independence movement that is winning people like this over. Well, for starters, it's not at all clear from anything I've read that uh, Nick McPherson has come around to supporting independence. I mean, he was the head of the Treasury during the 2014 referendum. And he broke all the civil service rules. He broke a long tradition of impartiality. And he came out publicly to oppose independence. And he used the Treasury machinery to produce report after report attacking uh, uh, the economic position and the economic viability of an independent Scotland. Now, immediately he retired in 2016, uh, and just after the uh, Brexit referendum, uh, he did publish an article in, in the Financial Times. Now, um, uh, McPherson is a card-carrying remainer and supporter of uh, staying in the EU. Um, so at this point, he comes out with an article in the FT which says, well, actually, folks, um, uh, now that now that the Remain position has been beaten, um, it would be quite nice if Scotland, if Scotland, if Scotland wanted to be independent and join the EU. Um, uh, it could have a very nice time because, of course, everyone's lovely inside the EU. So it was, his position isn't that he's in favour of it, Scottish independence. He was using the Scottish independence question uh, and, and the support for rejoining the EU as a stick to batter the Brexiteers with, and particularly his, his nemesis, uh, Dominic Cumming, whom he hates. He calls them, I mean, uh, McPherson always called uh, Cummings a Jacobin. And he was very glad the, the, the other month when, when Cummings left, because he called, I mean, because he, he was immediately in the press tweeting, saying, McPherson saying, the Jacobins have gone, we've got rid of the Jacobins. Here's the thing about McPherson, uh, which is entirely new, post his retiral from the Treasury uh, in 2016. He does what all ex heads of the Treasury do, he has to get a job in banking, doesn't he? Uh, he has to get the shekels coming in. So what he does is he becomes chair of Horace Bank, which is the oldest private bank in the city of London. So that sets him up nicely. Uh, but then he joins the board 
uh, of um, an investment trust called um, the Scottish American Investment Trust, um, which is here in Edinburgh. And uh, this is uh, uh, run or is managed by um, Bailey Gifford, which is a big Scottish investment trust uh, investment manager and is the major Scottish arm of neoliberal capitalism. Uh, Barry Gifford uh, made some very smart investments, owns big chunks of Amazon, big chunks of Tesla, uh, um, brought in early decade ago on the high-tech wave. So it all surprises people to know that a lot of American high-tech is, is owned here via, via Barry Gifford Scotland. So, Here's the ex-head of the Treasury, now on a key investment uh, platform for one of Edinburgh's uh, highest, most important uh, uh, finance capital organizations. So Mr. McPherson is not here just to, you know, just, just to live out his retirement. He is making a fast buck, and he's become a key member of the Scottish ruling class. Now, what, what is the Scottish government, what is the SNP government doing to prepare his 10-year uh, gold-plated plan for the future of the Scottish economy uh, post-COVID uh, uh, to green the Scottish economy. Who do you hire? You hire one of the leading members of the Scottish financial community, uh, one of the leading members of, 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 a, of an institute, uh, an investment uh, institute, which is major investments across the world. Um, uh, and, 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 you, and you bring in this guy, Nick McPherson, who is uh, uh, a was the, running the Treasury during the, the, the deepest moments of uh, the austerity program being run by George Orban. What kind of advice is he going to give? Is there, I mean, is he, are you hiring him to take his advice? Or is he going to tell you austerity? Is he going to tell you neoliberalism? Are you hiring him and you're not taking his advice? I doubt that. So, I mean, this is, this is a serious turn uh, by the Scottish government to hire the most reactionary people. And not just uh, not just advisors, but people who who have who are working for the big financial institutions globally, and so um, they will immediately be trying to cast Scotland in the mode they want, a uh, uh, minor part of the global neoliberal food chain. Um, and another th the, uh, another interesting thing that's happened because you mentioned it, the, this increasing domination, foreign ownership of, of Scottish industry. Uh, and there's been an excellent series on the ferret and some joint investigations between the ferret and the herald, uncovering just the extent uh, of foreign ownership and, and the monopoly power, basically, that, that dominates um, Scottish politics and Scottish culture, that three billionaires or whatever control uh, Scotland's top 10 newspapers, which have seen better days, um, that uh, a third of Scotland's largest wind farms are owned by companies that deal in tax avoidance schemes, um, that a majority of Scotland's largest uh, uh, wind farms are owned abroad. And of course, because this latest 10 year plan reminds me of the recovery plan, I can't even remember what it was called at this point, that came out a couple of years ago at the height of the, probably only a year ago at the height of the um, pandemic about how Scotland would re-emerge. And of course, it was also a bevy of um, elite figures. And one of its key ideas um, was uh, a green uh, investment portfolio that would attract, attract foreign direct, direct investment to buy out Scotland's renewable potential, which we keep hearing is is a massive bonanza for the people of Scotland. So this is the thing, this isn't a mistake. It's not just that this is sort of unplanned economic activity that's led to foreign ownership of Scotland's emerging uh, industries. This is government policy. And I mean, in one way, one's surprised by the lack of um, anger at what's going on. Uh, in another way, one isn't because I mean, Sturgeon has been so successful to be able to bamboozle people. Um, and so, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here in Edinburgh, and, and the other week we opened a new major um, shopping centre at the top of Leith Walk. I was in it this morning, uh, a monument to, uh, to global consumerism. Uh, the Scottish, Scottish Government and the SNP um, Town Council here put money into this big shopping mall and hotel. Um, who owns it? it? It's owned by um, uh, uh, an American property company, which is probably the largest uh, property company in the world in terms of doing 
uh, Global Investments, uh, a company called Nuveen. Uh, Nuveen buys up land everywhere. It's bought up huge amounts of land in Brazil. It's bought up much of the savannah land, which is burning or getting farmers to burn uh, in order to plant and uh, soya so that we can have cheap chicken here in Britain. So here, here he is this monument to uh, the nastiest side uh, of neoliberalism and destruction of the environment. Uh, building a, a, a shopping mall in Edinburgh, and the Scottish government signs them checks, gives them money, because they're frightened they'll go away. No, they won't. They're just, just taking the handouts. So, I mean, it, 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 if you dig down, and, and the, 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 the ferret, uh, uh, research ferret's a great kind of uh, uh, body for, 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 um, for doing investigative reporting, but if you dig down right across all of Scottish industry now, uh, and, I mean, the, the, only, the only bit of of, of Scottish economy, I can think of that's got any anything left of of Scottish ownership might be chunks of the construction industry. Uh, though even there, the big construction companies are, are, are UK wide. Um, but agribusness banking, um, I mean, I mean, it's, it's only ten years ago. Uh, uh, most of Scottish banking and finance was was was, was locally owned. Um, but uh, RBS and HBOS have long gone gone foreign. Um, so in Scotland, if it was made, if it was independent tomorrow, uh, more of our financial uh, sector would be foreign owned than I can think of anywhere else uh, in Europe, certainly amongst the small countries. We would have no, no ability to control our own credit flows. Uh, and people like Mr. Uh, Nick McPherson would, would, be, would be in the driving seat. And uh, anywhere else, this would have been a public, a, a public and political issue. I mean, in the, in the, in the you know, um, ancient now, but I mean, in, in the 60s and 70s, when we began to lose our uh, local, uh, locally owned industry, there was a big debate about deindustrialization and, and, and foreign ownership coming in. And the, the forerunner of Scottish Enterprise, the Scottish Development Agency, was set up in the 70s precisely to fund, using North CLO, a new generation of Scottish owned and directed industry. That's gone, gone by the board. Scottish Enterprise spends all its time giving money to foreign companies. I mean, the, 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 the saddest, saddest example was, you know, I think, a year and a half ago, um, when the Scottish government gave a grant to Netflix um, to make movies. What the hell are we doing giving an American, one of the big Americas, biggest, you know, uh, um, pirate uh, culture <laughs> vultures money to make TV, I mean, which we make our own TV, world films. I mean, the Scottish government sells out to absolutely everybody. And the sad thing, and I think this is a real political lesson rather than broad moaning, is how do we organize some kind of political resistance to this? And there isn't. Uh, um, uh, uh, I mean, the SNP is physically, as we know in the last year, has physically split uh, with all its old cater from the Sam years and before 2014 have left. Um, and uh, the, the, the people who are no party members seem to, in SNP, seem to be content. They have bought into uh, the, the salmon vision. Now, the trouble is, the Scottish economy is in a, is in a difficult position. Uh, and what we're seeing is new forces as we come out of, of COVID. We're seeing return of inflation. Uh, we're seeing an intensification of, of uh, inter rivalry between the Americans and the Chinese. Uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, it's not business as usual. Uh, at least, I suppose, you can say that Kate Forms, the economic minister, in setting up this new advisory committee, realized that she needed a plan, um, but expecting this plan to be produced to reform and revive Scottish economy, expecting that to come from Nick Phillips, and I think Nick, uh, Nick uh, McPherson, I think, is a, is a stretch too far. I mean, this is what makes this situation, I think, interesting, though. It's that um, the world is changing, you know, discussions about economics, and it's it's early days. Like, neoliberalism is not going to be overthrown in one fell swoop, and all these decades of dogmas and so on aren't just going to disappear overnight. But there are changes around the world. States are, you know, casting a more suspicious eye over global um, production chains and, and things like that. They are thinking about domestic economic capacity. Uh, other things that are changing, um, you know, include, you know, the, the return of inflation, as you mentioned, um, the fact that workers are suddenly in a position where many workers where um, wages are rising, there's a shortage of labor, you know, trade unions are very weak. So it's not a situation like in the past where that would have 
potentially led to significant advances for the working class, but it does put capital under new pressures and, and provide some new opportunities um, for workers. I just sort of wonder if um, we're now in a situation where the, the Scottish government seems to be completely adrift from uh, public consciousness, uh, you know, and any sense of its own vulnerability or responsibility. I wrote about this on the on, on the website this week, you know, there, there's so little challenge to this clique at the top of the Scottish government that they may be overreaching themselves at this point and not understanding that the problems they're storing up for themselves. Because it's very possible that uh, in, uh, elsewhere in Europe, including south of the border, there's this you know, relative change in political attitudes about what you do with your economy, how you protect you know, uh, element of, of your economy and so on. Meanwhile, in Scotland, the attitude is just, we're a marketplace, come in and buy up our shit, use us how you like, turn Edinburgh into a theme park. Um, and it's just this kind of old worldy stuff almost. And that this creates enormous pressures around around the Scottish political system. I, I agree with that uh, entirely, and I think I think there will come a moment um, uh, when all these economic pressures um, really start bubbling over, uh, when this will become a, a, a political issue, uh, and then the Scottish government will discover that, that it's, it's you know it's the emperor's without any clothes; it doesn't doesn't know what to do. Um, take a very basic example. I mean, compared with most small economies uh, in, in Europe, um, uh, the Scottish government, the Scottish, and Scotland as a whole, has given up control of flows of credit. I mean, if, if, you are, if you're Switzerland or you're Austria or you're, you're the Netherlands or you're um, Luxembourg, I um, mean, you've, uh, you, you've got serious banks which are locally controlled and can come under political pressure. So if, if anything, if, 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 there's a, if there's a downturn, you can at least force uh, um, credit into the economic system locally. Um, we're about to discover in Scotland that we have we've given everything away. Uh, uh, the Scottish government has constantly said, oh, it's, you know, going to put a lot of effort into inward investment, which means uh, foreign banks coming uh, to get cheap labour and uh, cheap property in Scotland. But the control of those banks, and the, therefore the control of credit flows, is ex external. So Scotland suddenly finds itself without any credit control whatsoever, apart from uh, the one thing that the Scottish government did do correctly in the last four or five years, which is to create Scottish National Investment Bank, which is state-owned. But of course, they immediately handed over uh, the management of that to um, some of the most you know, some very key bankers. They, they handed it over to, to the banking community. And some of the key people on the board of the National Investment Bank in Scotland uh, were culpable uh, for the uh, when present in and during uh, the economic collapse in London in 2008. Um, so uh, uh, we don't therefore have the tools, um, uh, even if we were independent, uh, to be able to pump demand into the economy if there was an economic crisis, or if you wanted to try and shift investment away from consumption into, into uh, manufacturing investment to create um, uh, real jobs. Uh, as I say, we've sold off all of the, uh, the agribusiness, and if we end up in some kind of um, uh, uh, political warfare where supply chains globally uh, uh, break down, if, for instance, there's a decision you know, across, across Europe, well, we're not going to buy chicken that's stuffed full of uh, Brazilian, um, uh, Brazilian uh, 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 stock feed, so we'll, 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 we'll shorten the supply chains. If everyone stops short, shortening food supply chains, um, then um, Scotland's in trouble because we turn ourselves into this food exporter um, uh, for a norm. So we'll just shift the capital somewhere else. Uh, and anyway, I mean, if you, if you go back to our, our old friend, um, Nicholas McPherson, if you've been reading his tweets in the last uh, uh, few weeks, um, he actually came out in support of the trade deal uh, that Boris had done with uh, 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 with the Americans and with the Australians, because he thinks that cheap food, cheap imported food, is the real only gain we'll get from Brexit. In other words, Nick McPherson is supporting closing down Scottish agriculture in favour of cheap imported imported food, which is, of course is full of chemicals, this, that, and the other thing, which is why it's cheap. 
Um, so uh, you, you, you have to you have to think that all all, all the pillars on which the, the Scottish SNP government has built the economy for investment in the particular sectors of the for investment, all those pillars are about to go crash, and it does not have the Scottish government does not have uh, a plan or the resources or or the ability, I think. Uh, to, to move the economy, the economic planning elsewhere. Final point, of course, what's the latest whiz they've got? Um, Scottish government has come out in favour of um, uh, free ports. Uh, so it's tail ending um, the Boris Johnson government in wanting to introduce free ports, that is, zones with low taxation and deregulation in order to encourage even more foreign investment. Of course, they're branding the, the free ports green ports. Uh, and saying, God, golly gosh, uh, we won't uh, let anybody uh, get the low taxes and um, uh, deregulation unless they pay uh, uh, the national minimum wage. Oh, wonderful. Um, so no plans at all. Um, and I, I think you're absolutely right. This, the, this will all blow up in the face when we get a real, when, when, when the economic crisis sharpens up uh, over the next five years. I mean, it, it strikes me that um, devolution may you know and and the the, the continuity of devolution uh may actually make scotland quite a weak link in the chain for all the reasons that you've discussed you know how constricted uh our institutions are but also how constricted the debate has become in scotland because of the kind of political um stagnation and on top of um you know everything we've just discussed of course is this ongoing uh, concentration of power uh, in at the top of Scottish society, the the latest uh, emanation of which is the Police Scotland have begun an investigation uh, into the hundreds of thousands of pounds of missing uh, independence campaign funds, which uh, the SNP party treasurer has finally admitted were spent on um, election campaigns day to day. Uh, party business and 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 so on uh, after a thousand and one uh, assurances that this money was secure ring fenced and ready to be spent on an independence referendum the signs of which are you know absolutely um nowhere um now I'm, I'm not convinced that um uh that police investigation will come to anything simply because um i still sort of feel like Nicholas Sturgeon and the team around her have made themselves indispensable to the governance of Scottish society. It's very difficult uh, to, for the institutions around them to, to, to even pull them down a, a peg. But do you think that, that this might just add to uh, the general sense that we are discussing that, that political and economic life has stagnated here? Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I don't think the, the, the case investigation will come to very much. Um, the Scottish government is very carefully, the SNP government very carefully created a police Scotland, a national police force beholden to the SNP government. Um, I mean, in law, um, uh, as long as when it comes to the, you know, if it came to a referendum, as long as the SNP could borrow enough money uh, and to spend up to the, to, to that limit, the six hundred thousand, um, I think it would get away with it. Um, the real the real trouble is that um, it's squared off. SNP becomes squared off all of the um, the various parts of the establishment. It's even been paying subsidies to the Scottish media, um, which I think is very very dangerous for any media to take to take money from any government. Um, so. It is what are the other options? That's this is this, you know, we, you know, let's let's get away from just the enjoyment of, of, of beating the SNP over the head uh, for what they've done. Um, the, 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 if you look at the May election last it was only it was only you know a month and a half since the elections here in Scotland, the SNP vote went up. The uh, actually the, the 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 poll went up. I, I thought you know. Uh, the number of people voting would go down, but the number of people voting in Scotland went up across the piece in May. It's as if people could, you know, the only, I mean, faced with being stuck under, you know, another 10 years of Tory government, uh, how terrible that is, and the racism and the incompetence. Um, and it's Tory government proving more and more incompetent and incapable, uh, not just right wing. 
Um, faced with this, you know, no alternative, the Scottish people voted for the SNP because it's the only thing that was there that offered an option that might lead to independence and might get pe people's call out of the clause of the Johnson government. So I can understand why people went in that direction and surprised us all by coming out and voting and putting the SNP vote up and the SNP got, even got a few extra seats. But if, then, if nothing then happens, if we are in stasis, as you suggest, political stasis. Um, you, you run the risk that people become demoralized and you could, I think you've already seen this in the, in the national movement. Uh, and I worry that we'll, we will see, uh, even post COVID, we'll see the, the huge demonstrations, the 200,000 people who marched in Edinburgh for independence before COVID. Will we see that again uh, once it becomes free to march? I think there's a growing um, uh, demoralization within the active end of the movement. And I think for ordinary voters who are, are actually over the next two years going to see that nothing much is happening, uh, nothing has changed, that the, the SNP government doesn't have an economic plan. If it has any economic plans, one written by Nick McPherson, for God's sake. Um, so, uh, I mean, unless we can insert some kind of initiative uh, into this, this, this stasis, uh, then I think um, things are going to go running backwards very, very quickly. I personally doubt they will get a referendum. So Boris Johnson's never going to offer a referendum unless he can win it. Um, but who knows? The circumstances might well be uh, as happened in Quebec uh, at the end of the 20th century um, that uh, uh, support for independence starts to roll back. Not because people don't want self determination, but because they, they don't think now in the hands of the SNP that very much is going to change. And I think we're beginning to see some slight shift in working class support. Uh, for independence, not that they don't want self-determination, but they want something more than that. They want self-determination to have a different kind of Scotland. And if they don't think Scotland's going to be different under, if it's going to be run by Nick McPherson, then what the hell are you going to go and vote for? Uh, and then you start to get abstentions. So we need some kind of alternative initiative from the SNP government. But could there be a fight inside the SNP itself? I'm beginning to doubt it. We, I mean, I was a member. We tried in the last major elections inside the party. We won all sorts of seats against the leadership. Um, the leadership then essentially closed down internal democracy, and a lot of the people who led that uh, resistance have left the party. Um, so, uh, I mean, Sturgeon's in charge. Um, I re what I really fear is that at some point in the next two years, she decides she, she can retire, go and run a quango somewhere. The SNP will discover um, it's got, you know, it's got. No, no real alternative to her that at that popular uh, we begin to move in an opposite direction. So we need to win the left. This is a problem. You know, we, we, we've been deriding the SNP today, uh, um, David, but you know, let's blame ourselves. There is a fundamental problem in the Scottish left. It's divided, uh, it lacks initiative, it lacks direction strategically. And unless the left can pull itself together and create some kind uh, of, of, of direction to take on the SNP leadership, uh, then we are in serious existential trouble. Okay, uh, sobering thoughts. Thanks very much for that, uh, George. And uh, I'm sure we'll have uh, cause to discuss all these matters again soon. Um, thanks everyone uh, for watching. Just a reminder to go to concert.co.uk. Uh, for, to read about all these issues and much more. And please uh, like and subscribe to this uh, channel uh, to help us uh, get more of these videos out and in circulation. Uh, I look forward to speaking to you all again soon.